Chapter 15 It's him! It's the dead boy! It's him! Was that me shouting those words over and over? I could feel everyone's eyes on me as Adriana and Laura pulled me from the bleachers. It's him! Let me go! The dead boy! The dead boy! I have to see him! The buzzer went off right over our heads. It shocked me into silence. My friends dragged me to the gym doors. I struggled free. I had to see him, had to talk to him, but the players had all turned away. They were running off the floor to the locker room. Martha, come on. Adriana pulled me out into the hall. She and Laura led me away from the food stands, down the long hallway. We stopped at the stairs beside the darkened cafeteria. I'll get her something to drink, Laura told Adriana. I watched her run back toward the gym. I sat down on the bottom step. Adriana dropped down beside me. Martha, are you okay now? I, I don't know, I replied honestly. I shut my eyes and saw the players again, the players with the same face, his face. Am I okay? I really don't know, Adriana. When I opened my eyes, she had a large silvery coin in her hand. Let me show you a relaxation exercise I learned from Dr. Corbin. It always calms me down when I'm stressed. She held the coin up close to my face. Watch the coin, she whispered. Follow it with your eyes. She moved the coin slowly, left to right, close to my face. It glimmered dully in the dim light. Adriana whispered softly as I followed the coin. Concentrate on the coin. Calm. Calm. Just watch the coin. Eager for the faces to disappear, I obeyed. I wanted to be calm. I wanted to be okay. The coin floated slowly in front of me, back and forth, back and forth. I grabbed Adriana's hand. Whoa, what are you doing? It's okay, Martha, she replied softly. She gently removed my hand from her wrist. I'm giving you a hypnotic suggestion to calm you down. I narrowed my eyes at her. Her face disappeared into shadow, then came back into view as she leaned close. You're hypnotizing me? I demanded. She nodded. Her black hair fell over her shoulders. Relax. I do it to myself all the time. It's easy. She raised the coin again, but I brushed her hand aside. I'm feeling better, I told her. Laura hurried up to us. She handed me a paper cup of cold water. She studied me as I took the cup from her, her face filled with concern. You okay? I nodded, took a long sip of the cold water. Yeah, I'm fine. Really. I, I don't know what happened in there. I heard shouts from the gym, loud laughter in the hall. I wanted to be laughing too. I didn't want to be sitting here in the dark, sipping water, staring into my friend's worried faces. What happened? Laura demanded. I shook my head. I tilted the cup and finished the water. I don't know. I saw the face, you know, the face I've been drawing. The Tigers, the whole team, they all had the same face. I saw Laura exchange glances with Adriana. Pretty weird, Adriana muttered. I took a deep breath. Whose face is it? I demanded. I jumped up from the step and grabbed Laura by the shoulders. Tell me, tell me right now, whose face is it? Adriana gently pulled me away from Laura. You know we can't do that, she said, softly but firmly. Laura lowered her eyes. I wish I could help you, Martha, but your doctor said, Tell me, I screamed, tell me. Let's get you home, Laura said softly. They started to guide me to the doors. My legs felt shaky and weak. My whole body felt tense and trembly. People were standing around outside the gym, eating and talking. Some kids called to us, but we kept walking. I tried not to look at anyone. I was afraid. Afraid I'd see the boy's face again. We passed the gym and turned the corner, making our way to the back door that led to the parking lot. The air turned cooler. I could hear the buzzer in the gym. The second half was about to begin. I suddenly felt so terrible. I just wanted to have a good time, and now I'd spoil the whole evening, for myself and for my two friends. I opened my mouth to apologize when I saw someone against the lockers at the far wall, a boy and a girl, hidden in shadows. They had their arms wrapped around each other. The girl had her back against the lockers. The boy was kissing her, kissing her. His back turned to us. He pulled his head back and turned slowly as the three of us started to pass by. I guess he heard our footsteps on the floor. He turned and his face came into view. His face. I saw his face. I didn't want to believe it, but I saw him so clearly, saw his face so clearly. No, I cried. It's you. No. Chapter 16 Martha, wait, he called. He spun away from the girl against the locker. 
Aaron, I choked out, and as he came toward me I saw the girl, saw the tangle of red hair, the pale, round face, the bright red lipstick, smeared from kissing. Justine, her lipstick smeared from kissing Aaron. Aaron and Justine. Martha, listen, Aaron started, breathing hard. From kissing her, or from the surprise of seeing me? He took a deep breath and started again. Martha, I have to tell you. Adriana shoved him back. Not now, Aaron, she said sharply. Martha is having a tough time, Lara told him. She tugged me away. Go away, Aaron, Adriana said coolly. You too, Justine, just go away. No way Martha wants to talk to you now. She and Lara pulled me away. I saw Aaron give a helpless shrug. I tried to read his expression, but I couldn't figure it out. Did he look guilty? Embarrassed? Didn't he care? I saw him and Justine turn and head to the gym. Then suddenly, I was out the door, into the dark night. The darkest night. My darkest night. Plunged into such cold darkness. Because I believed in Aaron. I believed he cared about me. Not Justine. Not Aaron and Justine. Now what could I believe in? What? I can't even believe in my own mind, I realized. Such a dark night of hallucinations, of unreal faces, and real faces. Aaron and Justine. Why couldn't they be a hallucination too? Why were they kissing in the hall when I believed in them? What can I believe now? Before I realized it, Laura and Adriana were gone. I was back in my bedroom, back in the light. Staring into the harsh white light of my desk lamp. Sitting there, sketching again drawing the boy's face, staring into the bright light as if being warmed by it, calmed by it. I never wanted to see the darkness again. I wanted to stay in the light, swim in it, bathe in it, live in it, and draw the face, draw it again and again. And as I stared into the light, the face began to move. It moved in my memory. Another scene, a lost scene from that forgotten November. My memory started to return. I stared into the light, willing the memory back, willing it to life. Will I get it all this time? I asked myself, gazing into the warm white light filled with eagerness and cold dread. Chapter 17 Don't push me like that, I whispered. He grinned at me, his face so close, so close I could smell the chocolate on his breath. You like it, he insisted. No, I tried to shove him back. He had his arm around my shoulder. He pressed against me. No, I don't like it. Really? That made him laugh. He pressed closer, lowered his head and kissed me. I tasted the chocolate now. He'd been eating a candy bar. He pressed his lips harder against mine. Too hard. I tried to back away, but he was holding on to me so tightly. I couldn't breathe. I heard the others in the other room of the cabin. Heard something crackle loudly in the fireplace. Heard Justine's high laugh. Why wasn't I with them? Why wasn't I with my friends? Why was I in the back room of this cabin, kissing this strange boy when I should be with my friends? Where was Aaron? Why wasn't I kissing Aaron? I listened for his voice in the other room. Heard Ivan instead. Heard Ivan say, Throw another log on. Hey, somebody, throw another log on before it dies down. Heard Adriana tell her brother, You do it. Don't just sit there ordering us around. I wanted to get up, join them, see the fire, be with Aaron. I was still going with Aaron. I should be with him now. But the boy held on to me, held me so tightly, and kissed me again, rubbing his face roughly against mine, hurting me. No, Sean, please. His name is Sean. Sean? Sean? I know his name. Staring into the white desk light, I struggled to see more. I knew the boy's name, but I needed to see the rest. What happens next? I asked myself. I know your name, Sean, but who are you? Why am I sitting in the dark with you? Why am I kissing you? What happens next? I stared into the light, struggling to see more, struggling to see everything, and I saw myself shove Sean hard. He reacted with an angry cry. He shoved me back. We jumped to our feet. I could still taste the chocolate on my mouth, the chocolate of his rough kisses. But now we were fighting, shoving each other, shouting. I couldn't hear the words. I could feel my anger. More than anger. I felt rage. I shoved him in the chest. I slapped him. Oh, the sound of that slap. But why were we fighting? Why? With a trembling hand, I clicked off the desk light. I didn't want to see any more. It was too upsetting. My whole body shook. 
The back of my neck felt cold and damp. The memory had been so sharp, so painfully clear. I wasn't just remembering that night. I was reliving it. I started to pull myself to my feet, but a blinking red light caught my attention. I stared down at my answering machine. The blinking light meant that I had a message. Had it been blinking the whole night? I pushed the button and listened to the squeal of the tape rewinding. A few seconds later, the message began to play. I heard crackling. A lot of background noise, like from a restaurant or a crowded room. And then a girl's voice, harsh, raspy. A girl's whispered voice. You keep drawing him because you killed him. Huh? I let out a startled cry, leaned closer, listening for the rest. But the caller hung up. A click, then silence. The tape rewound itself. I pushed the button, listened to it again, gripping the edges of my desk. You keep drawing him because you killed him. No, I wailed. Laura, is that you? Laura? It sounded like Laura, making her voice low and raspy. Laura disguising her voice. Is it you, Laura? What do you mean? I pushed the button and played the message again, and again, and again. You keep drawing him because you killed him. No, no, I told myself. It can't be true. It can't be. Laura, was that you? Did you leave that horrifying message? Why are you doing this to me? Chapter 18 Please come in. Dr. Corbin held open the door to her inner office, and I followed her inside. She was a short, gray-haired woman, tiny with delicate doll-like features. She wore a black pantsuit that fit her perfectly. She could have been anywhere between forty and sixty. I really couldn't tell. Her office was small and dark. Every surface was cluttered with piles of books, thick folders, stacks of magazines, and papers. She had no nurse or receptionist. She was all alone here, in this dark, cluttered office. Such a serious room. The Garfield the Cat cookie jar on her desk seemed totally out of place. I felt the blood start to throb at my temples. I suddenly felt really tense. I should turn around and leave, I told myself. But no. I felt so desperate now. So frightened after that ugly phone message. I had to find out the truth. All of it. I had to know. The doctor's warm smile reassured me. Take a seat, Martha. She motioned to the wooden chair in front of her desk. It's cold in here, isn't it? I nodded. A little. It's very windy out. I've been fighting with the landlord about the heat, she said, lowering herself into her desk chair and shoving a stack of files aside. Do you need a sweater or anything? I was wearing a big, long sleeve t shirt over black tights. No, I'm fine, really. I crossed my legs, then uncrossed them. I felt so uncomfortable. How can I help you? Dr. Corbin asked, smiling again. I, well, I took a deep breath and started again. I'm interested in hypnosis, Dr. Corbin. I know it's your specialty. I mean, you hypnotize people, right? She slid open her center desk drawer and pulled out a long yellow pad. She set it down on the desktop in front of her, but didn't write anything. Hypnosis is a tool that I use, she replied. She brushed a strand of gray hair off her forehead. And hypnosis can be used to help people get back their memory, right? I asked, squeezing the wooden chair arms. She nodded. Then she raised her tiny gray-blue eyes to mine. Do you have memory loss, Martha? Well, yes, I sighed. Something happened last November, some kind of accident. I haven't been able to remember it, just pieces of it. I crossed my legs again. My heart was suddenly pounding. I really want to know what happened to me, Dr. Corbin. Can you hypnotize me? Can you hypnotize me and bring back my memory? She grips the yellow pad with both hands, sliding her hands up and down the sides of it. You've had memory loss since last November? I nodded. She narrowed her eyes and leaned across the desk. You are under a doctor's care, right? I nodded again. Yes, but... She raised a hand to stop me. Did you bring a note from your doctor? Any instructions? No, I didn't tell him, I blurted out. Dr. Corbin sank back into the desk chair. Well, I could telephone your doctor, I suppose. You see, I cannot proceed until I have spoken with him and learned all the details. It wouldn't be right. In fact, it could be quite damaging. No, please, I started. I knew that Dr. Sales wouldn't approve of this. I knew he'd be upset that I came here without telling him. Dr. Corbin tapped a pencil against the yellow pad. How did you find out about me, Martha? How did you know to come here? My friend Adriana, I told her. Adriana Petrakis? Oh, yes, of course. Dr. Corbin smiled again. 
She was having trouble sleeping. And you really helped her, I said breathlessly. She told me how you showed her how to hypnotize herself. It helped her a lot. And the other night I had some trouble at the basketball game, and Adriana hypnotized me, and she... She what? Dr. Corbin jumped to her feet, her face tight with shock. Adriana did what? She used a coin. She gave me a hypnotic suggestion to calm me down. I think it worked because... She has no business doing that, Dr. Corbin explained. That is so dangerous, Martha. Adriana doesn't have the skill or the knowledge. She doesn't know what she's playing with. You must never let her try that on you again. Uh, I'm sorry, I muttered, swallowing hard. Oh, no, I thought, feeling my stomach tighten with dread. Now I've gotten Adriana into major trouble. She was just trying to help me, I offered. Actually, I think it did help me. Dr. Corbin didn't seem to hear me. I'll have to call her, she said fretfully. I'll have to speak to Adriana and her parents. I uttered a frustrated groan. But what about me? I blurted out in a high, shrill voice. Will you hypnotize me? Will you help me get my memory back? Dr. Corbin shook her head. She fixed a sympathetic stare on me. I'd like to help Martha, she said softly, but I need to talk to your doctor first, and your parents. I need their permission before I can. I didn't wait for her to finish. I leaped up from the chair, so hard I sent it toppling to the floor. As it clattered onto its back, I turned and ran, out of the dingy, cluttered office, through the tiny, dark waiting room, out the front door of the rundown building. Dark clouds hovered low in the sky. The air felt heavy and wet. I sucked in mouthfuls of cold air. Then as I started to my car, a figure stepped away from the wall. Martha, wait, he called. I froze as he stepped out of the shadows. Sean! My knees started to buckle. I felt myself lose my balance, start to collapse to the pavement. He hurried across the parking lot. Sean? No, not Sean. Aaron. Aaron, what are you doing here? I choked out. He wore a brown leather bomber jacket over a black flannel shirt. The jacket flapped open as he ran to catch up to me. His dark hair flew around his head. Martha, whoa! He stopped in front of me, his breath trailing up over his head. He brushed back his hair with both hands. I want to explain, he said breathlessly. I could feel my throat tighten. Once again, maybe for the thousandth time, I pictured him in the dark hall at school, kissing Justine kissing my friend, Aaron and Justine. I eyed him coldly. I realized in that instant that I didn't feel the same way about Aaron anymore. I still cared about him. Maybe I even loved him, but I didn't trust him. I want to explain, he repeated. He placed a hand on the shoulder of my jacket, but I stepped back, away from his hand. Well? Go ahead, I challenged him. I wanted to sound cold and hard, but my voice trembled. Justine and I are tired of sneaking around, Aaron said, his dark eyes on mine. In a way, I'm glad you saw us. You and Justine? I couldn't keep the hurt out of my voice, but his words cut through me, sharper than a cold wind. He nodded. Justine and I didn't want to hurt you, Martha, but we've been going out for several months. Is that why Justine and I got into a fight up at the cabins? I demanded. Aaron nodded. Yes, you remember that. Yes, I'm remembering things, I said coldly. But Aaron, you and I... My voice trailed off. I didn't know what to say. I felt so much hurt. And my hurt was quickly giving way to anger. I'm really sorry, he murmured. He lowered his eyes. We know you're still in shock. Since what happened? I guess that's when I totally lost it. I grabbed his shoulders with both hands. I started shaking him. Hard. What happened? I demanded. Tell me, Aaron. Tell me now. What happened? What happened to Sean? His mouth dropped open in shock. He grabbed my hands and held onto them, forced me to stop shaking him. You, you remember Sean, he stammered. Aaron took a step back. He seemed to stagger, as if overcome with shock. You remember Sean? I nodded, studying Aaron's startled expression. Why does Aaron look so frightened, I found myself wondering. Why is he frightened that I'm starting to remember? Tell me what happened, I insisted. Tell me now, Aaron. I, I can't, he stammered. He turned away from me. It's too horrible. Chapter 19 After school on Wednesday, I heard shouts as I made my way to my locker. I turned the corner and saw two boys wrestling, shoving each other in the middle of the hall. A crowd had gathered. Kids were screaming and cheering. I heard an angry cry. One boy sprawled backward into a metal locker. 
The sound of the collision rose over the excited screams of the crowd. As I jogged toward them, the boys grabbed each other. A hard punch made a head snap back. Some kids screamed. I saw a trickle of blood puddle the floor. Gazing up, I saw Ivan. Ivan throwing himself on a boy I didn't recognize. Blood gushing down Ivan's chin, staining the front of his gray shirt. Ivan, stop! I shrieked. They were down on the floor now, grunting and shouting, punching each other. Ivan, red-faced, sweat drenching his forehead, grabbed the boy's throat with both hands. I dove beside him, reached for Ivan's shoulders, determined to pull him off, to pull him away. He was choking the other boy, his hands tightening around the boy's throat, choking him, choking him. They rolled away from me. Ivan, stop! I shrieked at the top of my lungs. Stop! And then there were other hands tugging at the two fighters, other voices, harsh shouts. I climbed to my feet and saw Mr. Hernandez, the principal, tugging Ivan away. The other boy lay on his back, rubbing his neck, groaning. He had blood down the front of his denim shirt. Was it his blood or Ivan's? I couldn't tell. I gazed at the blur of bodies, the excited faces. Two teachers were helping the boy to his feet. He groaned and blood gushed from his open mouth, thickly down his chin. What was that about? Somebody behind me demanded. Ivan started it, I heard a girl mutter. Who was the other guy? I don't think he goes to Shady Side. Well, what were they fighting about? Look, one of them lost a tooth. Yuck! I stepped away from the excited conversation. I really didn't want to hear it. I felt so bad for Ivan. I turned the corner and saw Mr. Hernandez pulling Ivan down the hall. Ivan had his head lowered, his black hair toppling down in front of his face. Like a criminal, I thought. My friend, Adriana's brother, being taken away like a criminal. I sighed. Ivan, what is your problem? The phone was ringing when I finally got home from school. I tossed down my backpack and hurried to answer it. Hello, I said breathlessly, pulling off my coat with my free hand. Martha, it's me. Laura, did you hear about Ivan? He got suspended from school, Laura said, speaking rapidly, excitedly. I was there, I told her. I let my coat fall to the floor and stepped away. I saw the fight. It was a really bad one. I guess, Laura replied. I could picture her rolling her eyes. Hernandez suspended Ivan for two weeks. His parents have to come in for a conference tomorrow. Wow, I murmured. They're not going to be happy about this. What was the fight about? Laura demanded. I shifted the phone to my other hand and sat down on the floor leaning against the wall. I don't know. They were already killing each other when I showed up. The other boy was from Drake Academy, Laura informed me. He doesn't even go to Shadyside. He's one of Ivan's friends from... Some friend, I interrupted. They really were trying to kill each other. Laura let out a long moan. I can't believe I used to go out with Ivan. Thinking about it just gives me the creeps. He's such an animal. I'm so glad I broke up with him. I had a flash of memory. So surprising, I nearly dropped the phone. Laura, I said, swallowing. You broke up with Ivan to go with Sean. I heard her gasp on the other end of the line. I waited for her to reply, but heard only silence. Laura, I urged her to answer me. The memories were washing back, bright pictures sweeping into my mind. Martha, you remember Sean? Laura finally said in a tiny voice. You broke up with Ivan that week, I told her, shutting my eyes shutting my eyes and letting the pictures come back to me. Yes, I, Laura started, but I didn't let her finish. I didn't want to interrupt the flow of my memories. You broke up with Ivan at the cabins. He was so upset, he and Sean almost got into a big fight there. Yes, that's right. Laura's voice suddenly sounded cold, distant. I, I don't want to talk about it, she stammered. You have to talk about it, I cried. You have to tell me, Laura. No, she insisted. No, I don't. I can't. I have to go now, Martha. Wait, I cried. Did you call me the other night? Did you leave a phone message for me? I have to go, Laura repeated. Really? Laura, answer me. Call me later, she said breathlessly. I have to go. We'll talk later, okay? Bye. The phone went dead, but I stood there with the receiver in my hand staring at the wall, the white wall. The memories were flooding back. I shut my eyes and let them come back. The pictures were so vivid, so clear. This time I was going to see everything. I was going to remember it all, all the fun, all the trouble, all the horror. Chapter 20 Ivan pulled the sled toward the cabin. Sean did a belly flop onto it. Give me a ride, man, Sean called, grinning up at Ivan. Ivan grinned back. I'll give you a ride, off the side of the mountain. 
He dropped the sled rope. Get off, Sean. No way I'm pulling you up the hill. Sean laughed and rolled off the sled into the deep snow. He grabbed two handfuls and heaved them at Ivan. Think fast. I watched from a short distance down the hill. I pulled a sled behind me, too, an old wooden flexible flyer. My legs ached. I had been sledding all afternoon. We had all been sledding, me and all of my friends. Justine, Adriana, and Laura, Aaron, Ivan, and Sean. Sean wasn't really part of the group. Well, I guess maybe he was the newest member. Sean was Ivan's friend. Ivan had met him at a bowling alley or someplace. Sean lived in the old village, but he didn't go to Shadyside High. I liked Sean. I thought he was interesting looking with his dark eyes, his serious expression, and the tiny white scar that cut across his eyebrow, the one flaw that kept him from being perfectly handsome. Stack the sleds against that wall, Adriana instructed us. Adriana had been in charge for the whole long weekend. Her parents owned the two cabins we were all staying at but her parents never used them. Too busy fighting, I thought with some sadness. So Adriana was in charge. They were Ivan's cabins too, of course, but Ivan wasn't the kind of guy to give instructions, or be helpful in any way. Ivan only cared about sneaking off and being alone with Lara. I dropped my sled beside the others. Aaron helped me stack it on top of the pile. He smiled at me. That was awesome sledding. I started to reply, but he hurried away to join Justine and Lara. Skiing next, someone shouted. Yeah, let's hit the slopes. A narrow ski run dropped down beside the cabins. Such luxury, I thought, to have your own private ski slope. I glanced around. Justine and Adriana had opened the shed and were pulling out skis and ski poles and tossing them onto the snow. Ivan and Lara were head to head, arguing heatedly about something in front of the boys' cabin. Aaron had disappeared into the cabin. Then Ivan and Sean were throwing snow at each other again beside their sled. I took a deep breath. The air smelled so fresh and piney, the late afternoon sun still floated high in a cloudless blue sky. Come on, let's ski, Adriana urged, calling everyone to the shed. We want to go into town for dinner, right? It's getting late. I gazed down the ski slope. Not very difficult, I decided, not too steep. A straight path between two rows of tall fir trees. Pretty easy, even for a beginner like me. Who's going first? Laura called, hurrying away from Ivan. I saw Aaron step out of the boys' cabin and come jogging across the snow. Aaron was an expert skier. This slope was baby stuff to him, I knew. We have to go one at a time, Adriana told us. The slope is so narrow. I turned to see Aaron dragging Ivan over to the skis. We have a volunteer, Aaron shouted. Ivan scowled and angrily pulled away from Aaron. I saw Aaron react with some surprise. Ivan spit in the snow and muttered something to Aaron. Hey, what's your problem? Aaron asked Ivan. Laura had walked over to Justine, and the two of them were talking, serious expressions on their faces. Who's going first? someone asked. I think Martha goes first, Adriana replied. She grinned at me and handed me a pair of skis. Why me? I demanded. You were the champion sledder, Adriana declared. A few kids cheered. You've won the first spot, Adriana continued. Are you kidding? I fell off my sled three times, I exclaimed. I nearly smashed into that tree. I'm going second, Sean announced. Good, then you can rescue me when I break my leg, I told him. I bent to fasten the skis. My heart started to pound. I had only skied two or three times before in my whole life. I really didn't have much confidence. I knew I was about to make a total fool of myself in front of my friends. I couldn't get the straps right. I turned and saw Adriana and Justine and a couple other kids watching me. Somebody else go first, I shouted. These straps are messed up. Okay, here goes, I heard Sean yell. I fixed the straps, pulled them tight. Then I stood up in time to watch Sean start his run. I moved to the edge of the hill, the skis crunching in the crusty snow. Sean pushed off with both poles and started down. It was steeper than I thought. He bent forward and picked up speed. His skis slid over a bump. He kept his balance and swooped down faster. And then, up ahead of him, I saw the silver line. A silver line across the ski run. So slender. A glimmer. A glimmering thread against the white snow. Shimmering in the sunlight, it cut straight across Sean's path. I stared at it, puzzled, trying to figure it out. What was it? It was as if someone had taken a silver pen and drawn a straight line across the ski run, from tree to tree. A silver line. It took me so long to realize it was a wire. 
It took me so long to realize that someone had strung a silver wire across the ski path. It took me so long, there was no time to scream, no time to warn Sean, no time to move. And a second later, maybe less, Sean skied into it. The wire caught him at the throat, cut through his neck, a straight line, a silver line. It cut through his neck. Bright red splashed on both sides of the silver line. I still didn't move. I didn't believe it. No one moved. We all stood at the edge, staring down in silence. The silver wire sliced off Sean's head. I watched his body continue to ski. The skis carried it for several yards before it collapsed, and Sean's head bounced onto the snow and emptied out, emptied out, emptied out, staring up at us, puddling the snow dark red.